So today's conversation, CrossFit is a pain sport. I think um, Wait, that wasn't a is that a statement? <laughs> <laughs> CrossFit is a pain sport. <laughs> <laughs> if you're on the go and you want to listen to just the audio version, subscribe to the Corpus Animus podcast on your favorite podcast app. Get better at the sport of CrossFit alongside some of the best athletes in the world in our online training program, The Design. Head over to our website, trainingthinktank.com backslash DSGN to learn more. Yeah, we're trying, I'm trying to think of a way to phrase it where the conversation we want to have is like about mental toughness and CrossFit being a pain sport. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to know y'all's thoughts and let's go down some deep rabbit holes of conversation on how you would actually even like measure that or um, would, what would you define it as? What, what's the opposite of that? So is it just a fitness sport, like the fittest, the person that's the, the best, has the best physiological metrics is going to win or is it more like are the toughest also the best in the sport? Is that yeah, a better that, question? Or that's the best a better in the question. Sport, also the toughest. Yeah. yeah. Before we dive in though, I want to start with a nice friendly competition. Is that what that was for? <laughs> this is for me to uh, time it. Chris, uh, you want to jump in on this as well? What is it? Sure. The question is, you know, when I ask when I ask the question, you have, I'll say, 15 seconds to give me an answer. We're all going at the same yeah, time. We all just yell it out loud? You didn't think through this competition. <laughs> <laughs> yell, yell it out loud and I'll let you know who's the winner. All right. All right. In the song, Hey Ya, how many times does Andre 3000 say, all right? 400. 127. 136. No, 16. <laughs> no In the whole song? <laughs> you counted it? You're all terrible. <laughs> I, right, like, all right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah. Um, it's only one time that yeah. he does that, and it's yeah. 16 straight times? Yeah. Wow. I said 400, and immediately it was like, there's no way you could say 400 <laughs> times in one four song. Yeah. How many did you say? <laughs> I said like 126. Or yeah, Actual so. retail prices? <laughs> <laughs> Can we delete this? <laughs> all right, so back to the question. Yeah, all right, moving on. What do you think, Brandon? Yeah, I, I would say that there's probably a, a good mixture between those two. Like, obviously, to be able to make it to a high level in the sport of CrossFit or any endurance type sport, you have to be quote unquote tough to some degree. But I think the kind of the, the way that I would steer this conversation for those that are listening, because most of us are try, just trying to figure out how to get there, is mental toughness kind of um, breaking those down into two things. One is, you gotta be mentally tough to kind of push yourself physically in workouts, but then also mental toughness is learning when to say no and learning when to say go kind of thing in yeah. your training. So there's times where it's tough not to say, I need to just work hard all of the time because that's what everyone else on Instagram is doing or other social media posts. But there also should be a balance there of like, I'm beat up, I'm tired, I'm sore, I'm gonna pull back and do some recovery work today. That's also being mentally tough. But it's just finding that balance to me because I think Working with so many people over the years, I've had a ton of people that are really, really tough and talented that just get beat up though. Yep. Yep. And people that are probably talented and not tough enough. So where, how can we draw everyone into the middle so we can kind of find a nice balance yeah, point? I see it very polarized, right? Like I have a lot of people that come to me and say, um, you know, I, I feel like I've got the mental toughness game down. And immediately I'm like, yeah, you don't. You, don't. <laughs> you know, and they're like, what training principles do I need? You know, this and that. And then I watch them train, I'm like, you're not tough. Like, yeah. they're, they're, I, that's very clear watching it, just like how they respond to pain. Um, and then I have the other side of it, the polarized side of that is someone who um, is basically working so hard that it's actually making them worse. Right, so they're like almost too tough for their own good, and that I think more comes down to more like discipline and knowing when to like back off and work smarter. Yeah, I think uh, my whole context for what toughness is has changed over the years because I think as a younger person, I would have considered myself more tough. Even I just remember training experiences going through a 2K row, for example, when I rode a 2K in 2010 at 640. That was a good time back then, and I remember the feeling of like. I couldn't breathe through my throat. It felt like yeah. I was like bleeding inside of my lungs for, for literally from like a minute in until I finished. And I yeah. remember afterwards being messed up for like two hours and the pushing through that experience felt like a force of will. Like yeah. no matter what uncomfortable feelings I feel with, I'm gonna push through it. <clears throat> now recently I did a 2K with Brandon in the design, I don't know, maybe like a year ago and I beat that score and the sensations of pain that I went through were so much less than yeah. what I felt in that 640, but I got a better time. Yeah. And I think the, the toughness that allows that type of process to happen is about the 
process, being a little bit more tactful about when I go and when I don't go, being a little bit more patient and deliberate with my training progressions and not always thinking that, hey, the adaptations are gonna come if I slam my head into the wall a yeah. million times in a week. Yeah, would you say that then measuring it is kind of a waste of time? Measuring toughness? Yeah. How would you measure it anyway? I don't know, I mean, I think you could come up with some tangibles maybe, or like um, yeah. how much someone could deal with, like how yeah. willing they are to push through pain or injury. And I'm not saying yeah. that's a good measure, but I'm like, if I had to measure, I don't know any other way. Because I think it's very confusing because if you look at like the best in the sport, you would assume, okay, well, they're at the top because they are the toughest, but is that the case? Watching Matt Frazier finish workouts where he doesn't look like he's in any pain, is he being tough? Is he just, is his fitness level so much higher that he doesn't have to be that tough? I'm not saying it's yeah. not tough. Yeah, but yeah, it's just an interesting thought experiment. Yeah, I, I think that most of the, the best in the sport have learned to be tough in their training to build that big base so that they don't have to spill over in workouts until the very end, right? So, like, you gave that example, and it's, like, the exact same thing with me. My best 2K time ever was probably the least painful because I paced it very well, and I was obviously much more fit than I've ever been. And so getting to that point was very painful and I had to be, you know, quote unquote tough yeah. to grind through intervals and prep for that 2K, but then I was ready. And that's kind of like what you hear. Like I'm, I was just watching the, the Lance Armstrong documentary that just came out 30 for 30 on ESPN. And you know, wh whether you agree or disagree with what he did, one of the things that he talks about is just like how prepared he always felt going into the Tour de France and then other races that he did. So he put all the work in before that and then he was able to test it without necessarily having to just kill himself every stage because if you did that, you couldn't make it through the over three weeks of grinding that they yeah. go through. Yeah, I think it's just a bad um, target for people to think if your goal is to be as competitive as possible in a sport, whether it's CrossFit or like Ironman or something that tr typically is is thought of as like, oh, you gotta be tough to excel at this versus like a skill sport or something like that that might not require as much toughness. I think that a focus on the performance metrics and getting better at the performance metrics and doing the things that are required in training to get better at the performance metrics will make you tougher. Yeah. But trying to get more toughness yep. will not necessarily make you better. Sometimes it'll just run you down and beat you up and make you injured. And I think that- or burn you out. Yeah, people that, you know, like, um, I remember reading the David Goggins book and David Goggins, I think, is one of like the people out there that talks about his life and his experience that just makes you feel not tough. Like For I sure. listen to yeah. that and I'm like, I'm so weak as yeah. a human. Just the, the, the amount of hardship I have not had to suffer really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you go through that process, like he's not going to be an elite CrossFitter because there's so many skills that you need to learn. There's pacing, there's a, there's a whole mental side of that thing that toughness is just like one of the other little dials. It's also like longevity, pacing, the neural skill of having all of that. So I think over emphasizing, hey, you need to be tougher, I, th I think over time will make people less good as athletes in this sport. Yeah, I, I like that book a lot and I think that that's a good book for someone who hasn't dealt with a lot of hardship that maybe hasn't um, had to meet the requirement of what it takes to be tough. So I think that those books are good because it brings perspective and like, damn, like I need to suffer some hardship and like beat myself up a little and like learn to be tougher. I also um, have not recommended that book to a lot of people that already have been through that kind of stuff where I don't think that that was actually going to help them. And I think that like it kind of ruins their discipline and slows their progress down. Yeah, yeah. it's real easy to, <clears throat> I think I've prided myself on being tough, like physically tough in workouts. Like I'm gonna grind, I'm gonna grind, but it also has broken me down over the years. Not necessarily even in CrossFit, but like playing football. Like yeah. I was always, I'm just gonna go and hit this guy head first as hard as I can, but then that causes concussions and shoulder you know, dislocations yeah. and a ankle issues and all kinds of other stuff. It's like, I wonder if I played a little bit different if it would have kept me healthier longer to then actually enjoy like the top of the sport. Whereas it was always a battle to be able to get on the field because I was hurt all the time. So I, I think that for that side of the coin, those that are just super tough but always feel beat up, then maybe it is reevaluating like, why am I taking pride in just being tough if I'm not making progress in the sport? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, how do you get people to focus on the right aspects? Because there are people for sure that I've coached that I'm like, you're just not comfortable getting uncomfortable. Right? Names! We yeah. need names! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're, you're not, like, their whole concept of heat management, like when they start to sweat, they're like, oh my God, I'm so hot. I'm like, you don't know yet yeah. what internal yeah. heat discomfort is 
um, or respiration, like their breath rate gets out of control. Like there's just people that aren't used to that and therefore not tough enough to deal with yeah, it. Yeah, too much of the coaching brain going on yeah. while trying to deal with that stuff. Yeah, so there are people that need like a little nudge into the, <clears throat> hey, you need to just be tougher and get tougher and explore the concept of toughness and then other people where you're like, I gotta reel you back. So how do you kind of differentiate that with people or, or perceive it? Do you do it through assessment or what? Yeah, for, for the, let's start with just one of them. I think that's probably a good way to go through this. Um, for those that we would perceive are not tough, I think the way that I typically work with those people is try to give them like micro goals and workouts. So like this, th I haven't used this in a long time, but like a super simple example is just like, all right, we're gonna do a 30 minute row at 150 beats per minute, right? And yeah, then distractions. Th yeah, like this is exactly what you're doing. And then each week progress that a little bit and you could do that same heart rate, but hopefully they're making some physiological adaptations to where let's say they got 6,000 meters the first time, all of a sudden they get 6,100 in three weeks at the same heart rate. That's where they can see some progress and they're like, wait, it kind of felt the same or maybe even easier. Yeah. So they build that base and then you can start adding in some interval type stuff to say, now we're gonna still do these same heart rate variables or this is the pace that I want you to hold or whatever it may be, but you need to do it for this long. It allows them to kind of focus in on maybe a task as opposed to them feeling like it's a 20 minute AMRAP, I'm trying to get as many reps as I can, but I'm hurting too bad. Yeah. And you're seeking discomfort at that point instead of exactly. seeking performance. Exactly. So it might not even be a good uh, focus cue for anybody, really. It might just not be a productive way to think about sport performance. Like, oh, I'm going to try to get as uncomfortable as possible and then deal with it. It might not necessarily be the way to go after it. Yeah, I think there's a couple of different approaches, and I think that... Um, if it's someone who has like a pain aversion to something that they're really bad at, like it's very, rowing is a great example. I've got tons of people that I've put on really basic rowing progressions that just freak out when pain starts to really settle in and they drop off. I've had them do rowing progression after rowing progression, week after week following a certain pace. And then when it comes time to do the 2K, they can't hold the pace. And I'm like, you literally just rowed 3000 meters at that pace the week before, which is yeah. more volume. Why can you put it together here? So I think something about the, the connection, the psychological fear of that. So I think the training needs to be very methodical with someone like that, where you're basically helping them be successful, very small each week, but it is like pushing them a little outside of the comfort zone, but not so much that they can't rebound from it each week, basically. And I think that that just comes with good training. Um, I think the next thing is to figure out, okay, why don't they want it bad enough to be tough in the moment? Mm -hmm. And if there's nothing behind that, then you're just gonna continue to suffer each week for no reason. So I think figuring out like, why is this important for you to, um, to basically deal with this pain and suffering? Because basically suffering without reason, um, you know, is, is they say masochistic in nature. That's yeah. a quote that I got from Viktor Frankl's book. Like you gotta have a reason behind it. So like, that's the first thing I start with. Yeah, and if you don't really have a reason, you probably are gonna be willing to deal with less suffering no matter what. 100%, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if there's no reason behind why you're doing it, it's so easy to check out. Yeah, yeah. I have a follow-up question. So do you want to kind of jump on that? I was just going to say I, I love that, and that's one of the other things I think that I've tried to do. Um, it's challenging with people, and maybe I just don't know they have the, the ability to do it well, but help the, guide them on the path of learning how to attack their goals, and then, but really kind of like creating a vision for them, I guess is a better way to put yeah. it, right? Like if someone has a big vision, then it's easier for them to kind of learn how to dig into workouts if they need to get tougher, yeah. you know, yeah. like if it's that type of person. Um, but on the other side, real quick, I think it's also pulls back to a vision, right? Like if we look at, hey, this is the end goal for you, but you keep getting beat up because you're too tough, that's yeah. kind of, let, let me as a coach be your guardrail, so to speak, to keep yeah. you in, in line so that we can make sure that you are progressing towards that goal. So I was thinking, I guess it's like kind of a question. So three little examples. The first, I get into a workout, I'm breathing out of control, my heart rate's out of control. That's one form of like pain or discomfort that I gotta deal with that's mental toughness. Two would be there's a really high skill demand for something that I need to do and I'm fatigued and then I can't coordinate the skill and I get frustrated. So something like double unders. I'm in the middle of a workout, my arms are blown up from doing handstand walking, I'm breathing out of control and I can't get my hands into the right spot and I keep tripping and then I have to deal with like that frustration. All too yeah. familiar. Yeah. <laughs> Overwhelming yeah. amount of thoughts coming in. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then the third would be say mechanical pain. So like Brandon with his knee doing deep squats or my back doing heavy repeated deadlifts. So are all three of those things, which are to me are all just like painful, dis uncomfortable, emotional or physical experiences, are they all classified as I need to be mentally tougher to get better at those? 
I think in a sense, yeah, I just think the approach is different. So going to the first example where it sounds like just dealing with discomfort and, and I would say like good pain or safe, safe pain. Safer pain. Yeah, yeah. Um, comes down to having a distraction like Brandon mentioned, right? So one, making sure that like you know what the reason is that you're there in that moment to deal with that discomfort and pain, you know, 2K row, for example, I want to like hit that number. I want to hit that PR. Beat somebody, so like qualify for you something. have to have an anchor that you focus on. If you don't have that anchor to focus on, you're just going to run around mindlessly. And like, as soon as the pain kicks in, you'll have no reason to basically fight back. Yeah. I think the next one was discipline in your thoughts. And I think that's a different approach. I think that's definitely a little more methodical and like, um, less aggressive in nature where it's like you're doing double and you're just like fuck I gotta be tougher I gotta like <laughs> no like I don't think that's the case I think you need to take a more meditative approach I think doing more visualization practices um, where it's building more mental resiliency when you have a million bombarding thoughts coming in and is that toughness or is that I think just it like is. discipline and focus it's a form it's, of toughness it's not the toughness that we would define as like more effort yeah. right it's just a different kind of effort like I was on the way here I started listening to um um, oh, yeah, I just forgot the name of it. <laughs> Bill Jackson did a forward um, of it, uh, The Mindful Athlete. Oh, okay. And he was talking about taking the bulls through meditation practices where he basically like decreased the training volume and they started basically doing more meditative work and it was successful. Yeah. And like, is that toughness? To me, yeah, I think it's just a very a, a different disciplined approach. It's a more granularity, a more granulated way of looking at toughness so that you could apply it differently to different types of limiters. Yeah, so, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, I was oh, gonna well, say the third, the third was? Like back pain, mechanical pain. Yeah. Because I feel like pushing through that one is almost stupid sometimes. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you might have to. I know like you had the lat injury at regionals and I was like, <laughs> like, all right, you got a choice. Like you might make it worse and it might not be good or you got to go through it. And yeah, you, just... you know, that's a really good example because I came to you and was in a lot of pain in the moment and the pain was overwhelming to the point where I was like, I feel very unsafe. I'm going to damage myself. Yeah. I, and realizing that, I was like, I don't really know why I'm about to push through this. Yeah, and, and then the workout was rope climbs. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I basically tore my lat and I had legless rope climbs coming up. Yeah. Um, you know, so I was just like freaked out and I don't know, like call it stupid or whatever, but that's why I'm doing the training at the moment. It's like push my body and take risk and have fun with it. Yeah. And you just asked a simple question, right? Like you asked, well, are you ready to let the team down if you have to pull out and not like putting guilt on yeah. me? Or are you willing to deal with that? And like immediately, like I didn't feel it anymore. Like, <laughs> like it was like a, yeah. a switch was, you know, flipped. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's just a good example of like, you know, if you're in a moment, it's okay to have circumstances like that where you push through those things, but in training, you can't do that every day. Yeah, I mean, you'd probably be broken pretty quickly if you did. Yeah, one of the questions I try to ask people and I've tried to do a better job of asking myself is, does this training or testing for you enrich the other aspects of my life that are my priorities? So like the thing I always used to say is protect what's precious. So like if someone's in a state of competition and that is one of the things that's precious to them, then it still is even taking that risk, enriching that part of their life. So for Mike, he's like, I'm not gonna let my team down, so I'm gonna make sure that I go after it and you didn't feel the pain while you're doing it. Obviously afterward, you had to deal with a bunch of rehab. <laughs> yeah, and <everything> sucks. Sucks. <laughs> but but you it, probably look back and say it was worth it, it because yeah. yeah, you guys still talk about those, the times that you had for those three days at regionals or whatever. Yeah. So for me, I've, I've also made that decision on the football field or in CrossFit or other things that I've done. Like you just kind of take those risks because you know it's in, still enriching another part, another goal, another vision that you have for your life. But I think some people do that without that focus of like, yeah. I'm just gonna go hard because this, this long-term goal that's so far down the road, but then they're just actually like putting speed bumps in the way yeah. to slow them down. It's almost just stupidity more than it is toughness. Right. Not, not stupidity is a wrong word, maybe ignorance. Yeah, I think that's really, a matter of opinion, right? Yeah. Like some people listening to this would be like, that's pretty stupid that you push through. You could have like really damaged your lat long term. But I'm like, at, to me, like sport is one of the most important things in my life. And like living my training and my life on the edge a little bit is like more important to me than being safe. Yeah. yeah. To give you an opposite example, sorry to cut you off, but I, I, right now in my life, I'm thinking more about my wife and two kids and wanting to be able to do things with them yeah. long term so that I still want to be a high performer in the sport because as a coach, like I want to be able to show like, hey, I'm still putting in the time, I'm putting in the work and I understand what it feels like. You know, I know what you're going through. But there are things that I may never be able to do fast again, you know, pistols, like mm -hmm. that thousand double unders in a session or really heavy squatting multiple days of the week. But there are ways I can get around that to make sure I'm safe. 
But if you said to me, hey, you have to go and do pistols, double unders, and heavy squatting, you know, four days a week to be the best in the sport, like that's not my goal anymore. My goal is to be healthy, be a good coach, and then also be a good father. So, and I'm not talking shit, serious question, does that make you less tough? I think it makes me more mentally tough. And this is how, this is why I wanted to kind of separate those two things. Because I think what our concept of toughness is always hurting bad in workouts. Hurting more. Hur yeah. Hurting more in workouts, yeah. 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 But in reality, in, at least in my opinion, and we can talk about how bad do you want it in a little bit of the other book that you, you have over there in a second, because I think they tie in well. Mental toughness to me is doing that if that's the enriching the other aspects of your life, but also s learning when to say no and pull back to be able to be healthy and, and, and fit in all the other priorities that you have. Yeah. That's why I mentioned earlier, do you think measuring toughness is kind of a waste of time? Because if we're just looking for the results, like who cares how you get there, yeah. right? Like who cares if it's like, well, your, your mental toughness was increased 20%. It's like, yeah. like, I don't care if your mental toughness goes down. If it yields a better result for performance, then like, so be it. Yeah. So I think it's, I think, I don't always think it's like a measurement or something that we need to like put so much focus on that like, um, has to be increased all the time. That's the thing is I think the reason why I said I think I'm, I'm more mentally tough right now is it's been a harder decision to say no to things yeah. especially like yeah. you guys are talking trash or I want to beat somebody in a workout it's harder for me still to pull back and say it's not worth doing that yeah. as opposed to just going <laughs> after it having fun and being like being on top you know yeah, what I mean yeah. like so so it's a different type of toughness because I'm just trying to be disciplined, but that discipline is much more challenging for me at this stage of my life. Yeah, yeah. I'd say I'm kind of different. Like I, when when the circumstances are necessary um, or the, the situation's right, I have seen myself push through a lot of pain and injury, especially like in competitions. But a large majority of the time outside of that, I'm like really easy to back off and be like, I don't really have a reason to right now. <laughs> and like, maybe that's good. Maybe it's allowed me to stay in the game for a long time. But there are times where I've realized that it's definitely hindered my training and I don't feel very tough sometimes. Like, you know, going against you and Metcons, like you know, two minutes into a 10 minute AMRAP, I'm like, well, you know, like I already know he's gonna beat me. So <laughs> it's really easy for me to not yeah. be tough anymore. Yeah. Well, I think that's an interesting thing though, because like, it's not that I'm more tough. It's just probably that in a cyclical thing, it's like more fit. Like, yeah. th but seriously, though, yeah. th and that's probably the other side of the coin. Like the original question is like, is Fraser, is Noah, is Travis, all these guys yeah. at the top, are they tougher than the average person? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, even if I just, so I use my own, let's say, use my own body. And we say toughness is a measure of dealing with more pain in a specific workout. If I want to make a 2K row as, as painful as I possibly could to test my headspace and how pain you wouldn't how tough I am, well, right? <laughs> I would go out at full speed. So start, start out a 112 and hold it for as long as I can and then basically die and not make it to the 2K marker until like, 10 minutes. I would love that to see that. That would be way worse of an ex experience for me, like almost a critical power test versus going out at a more pace conservative like pace and yeah. trying to hold it for as long as I can and then maybe if I have any gas at the tank sprinting at the end. So one case, I'm more tough for even just doing it, yeah. but I'm also way less fit in that way of doing it. So yeah. I think that same thing is true for elite athletes. They're not taking the hey, I need to be the toughest approach. They're taking the approach that's like, how can I win or get the best score possible and also do it in a way that it doesn't destroy my body because they're doing it not just multiple times like in a day, but multiple times in a day, every day of the week for years on end. Yeah. I mean, if you really look at the amount of volume Travis or Noah has done that was hard training, it's been basically a decade of mo like 80% of their year is hard type training. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, what tools then or differences have you used for certain types of athletes, right? So like, I guess I was asking a question, yeah. I'm just gonna answer it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've seen different approaches, so go back to the very methodical approach and I'll use two different examples. One is like, you need to be better at suffering in 20 minute AMRAPs with simple movements, burpees and thrusters. Are you talking to me now? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you and I, I both, I think, yeah. that's something we could both like yeah. improve in. Um, my biggest fear going to that, and I think what limits me from being tough is dealing with a high level of like respiration, heart rate, just discomfort for that amount of time. So I'm always safe for way longer throughout the entire workout than I should be, right? So like, what are approaches you would take to help someone that needs to be tougher in 20 minute AMRAPs? 
That was a question. You That's said you were going to answer now. your yeah. own question. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you followed up your first question with the second question. Um, well, I think the Ends first. Yeah, I think the first thing is that you have to expose yourself to whatever the thing is. Now, you don't need to expose yourself to it at max effort, at max level of toughness, but some of the mental toughness and the discipline is like, you know that you're not good at something, you don't like doing something, and right before it, you have this resistant type feel. I mean, when we first started doing the throwdowns, I would get in here and every day, my brain would be like, your shoulder's sore, you shouldn't do this. Like, you're gonna lose, you're gonna take last place. So what's that gonna mean? And you go through this horrible, like, internal experience. Part of the toughness is just starting. It's just like literally taking the first step. And then once you're in it, you kind of go through. The other, I think, is a more physiological, practical thing is that you need to practice the control and understanding of your breath. Yep. Like it's, it, for me, I'm much more comfortable bracing and holding my breath than I am breathing really fast for prolonged periods of time yep. and just getting comfortable with that because it feels like I'm hyperventilating and it makes me panic and I don't know how to calm my mind down and stay focused. So one of the things that I did is like, all right, I'm gonna go do drills like run for 10 or 15 minutes and control my respiratory cadence, like in on a two count, out on a three count, and just going through that process. Over time, it made me realize like, oh, I'm not just being mentally weak in these 20 minute workouts. It's not the only aspect of it. I'm also being physically stupid. I'm I'm holding my breath, I'm starting out too fast, I'm letting my mind get the control of my thoughts and going into panic mode instead of staying focused on the task. So I think some of it is just creating awareness as to the complexity of what's going on in people's heads, which is some through books, some through discussions like this. I think just creating awareness creates the path for them to figure out what it is like for them to make uh, gains in the toughness or yeah. discipline or focus side of the equation. Yeah, a lot of it's just building the skills, like you're saying, right? Like if you don't have muscle ups, the way to learn them is not to just do 20 minute AMRAPs with muscle ups. Yeah. Like you've got to kind of build the base. And like for me, learning a golf swing, for example, yeah. if I go out there and hit a thousand balls every single day, that's not going to make me better at golf unless I start fixing the positions of my swing. And yeah. that's something that I was just kind of thinking about. And so in, in this sport, uh, there are so many demands that you have to kind of, this is something we talked about on other podcasts, but we look at all these limitations and we, we have to pick some of those and say, okay, we're gonna drive these up for the next couple of months. And then we're gonna drive the next ones up and try to make a well-balanced athlete. But unless you're there, it's very hard to just jump into 20 minute AMRAPs and expect to be mentally tough or physically yeah. tough because you don't have the skills to do those things. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that's the very practical side of it. And I think the non-practical is like doing like reading and reading books that help you kind of reframe a self-concept of something you're bad at, which I think is also important. And I see that as like the first step. You want to be better at something, you need to reframe how you view yourself as doing it. I think that if you continue to view yourself as someone who sucks at 20 minute AMRAPs, you're going to have a lot of resistance every time you do it. You're going to go in thinking like, God, I suck at this. Like I suck at this. Like I'm only getting a little better at it. So like you got to like fake it till you make it. You got to lie to yourself. And that's really hard to do because you haven't convinced yourself that you're good at it yet. Yeah. So I think that starts and then leads with having practical application of good training practices. Combining those is like probably the most successful thing I've seen. I don't think they work independently of each other very well. What don't work independently? Just doing mental exercises to be better at something and then not having oh, actual good training practices yeah, yeah. to combine them. Like corpus animus. <laughs> and body together. Just like the name of this That's podcast. That's exactly <laughs> what I was going <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. so I mean, I think that's a, a big mistake too is like people are like, yeah, I want to be mentally tougher so I'm going to read books. And yeah, it helps. I think it helps reframe your concept of it. But you still got to put in the work and like yeah. actually practice the art of being tough in the moment in micro steps. Yeah. I think that's true of anything. Like you, you can't For intellectualize sure. a physical thing. Yeah. You have to be doing both sides of it. You yeah. have to be doing the mental work and the physical work. So yeah. maybe toughness is both. Yeah. yeah. That's been my critique of the, the whole flow movement for the last decade now is that a lot of people are pushing the, their audience into just the, you know, read the books, meditate and all those things. That, that is, I have never disagreed. Those things are very important if you want to be a high level athlete. But to actually get into a flow on the floor or in the arena or yeah. on the football field, you've got to practice the sport. Yeah. So it's learning to be the best at the sport with all the skills and being having the mental awareness yeah. to be able to do those things. Yeah, yeah. so I've mentioned that book I started reading Reading, and they talk about Phil Jackson's meditative exercises and I think people probably took that and were like I'm gonna meditate and in, in magically better skill and I'm <laughs> like it worked for them also because 
hundreds of thousands of hours of practice leading yeah. into that. So like that was maybe like the little, you know, finishing touch on it. Yeah, I wanted to, this might be a kind of controversial uh, perspective, but it's possible that, you know, mental toughness, I think in a large way has been promoted by elite athletes. Like, mm -hmm. you know, even I've heard Frazier talk about saying like, I'm willing to black out on the floor. No one's going to pass me. Like it's a purely a force of will type decision to make it happen. There, it's possible that for somebody at that level of performance, like he's already at the elite level, he's already displayed that he's better than everybody at everything on a, on a, on a broad scale of testing parameters, maybe his specific limitation, because he's so physically gifted and has so much capacity, is literally just learning how to deal with more discomfort because he never had to do it at that level to get to yeah. the elite level. So for him, mental toughness was the, like, the domino that like started the whole process of him becoming the best of the best. But yeah. you take somebody else without all those same physical skills and without all of the inherent genetic gift and you have them take that same mental approach and the domino that pushes over is their joints and they yeah. end up completely yeah. broken. So yeah, his body could deal with that. Yeah, so I think it's a really important thing to for people to understand that the whole concept of learning and becoming tough and self-awareness is a very individual process and you need to be careful of picking a role model that's like that yep. and then saying well that's what they say that's what they do that means that's what I should that's do. That's a great like, point. Mm, yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. I would I would I would say that the athlete that comes to mind for me that's probably the toughest and most willing to go there was Jason Kalifa. Oh my god. <laughs> How many times did you see that guy <laughs> truly black yeah. out yeah, in yeah. a workout yeah. Yeah. If, like on the biggest stage yeah. he, he would would him 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 and like, yeah, yeah. like Dan Bailey yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like all right they're they're yeah. in it right now. <laughs> they're tough. They're either faking that. it really well or they're like, <laughs> they're like clearly in the shit. Yeah, Kara Webb to earn my respect when she was uh, running oh, back from Earth that one year. I was yeah. like, if I was that uncomfortable, I think I'd just sit down and yeah. like, pour ice on me. I don't, there's probably no way to do it. And like, again, like it's impossible to measure, but it would be cool if they had a way to like show a, a track or a metric of like yeah. who's in the most pain and who's <laughs> dealing with it right now. Yeah. And you could say like put everyone on a rower and have them row, but like if it's you're a still, good rower, yeah. it's just different. Yeah. Yeah, it's you still can't. not the same. I would love that. Though. But it'd be it'd so be cool fantastic. to see. Could you <laughs> have a like, screen? To yeah. be like, oh man, yeah. he's, he's getting crushed right now. <laughs> yeah. with it. I would be way there. The yeah. It'd be interesting too to see who's showing it. Yeah. Because I think a lot of times that also happens. You watch somebody that is pretty elite do something and they make it look easy. Like it makes it look like you're not in pain. Then you talk to them afterwards and they're like, yeah, I was hurting like a minute in. I'm like, yeah. what? Yeah. And you kept working for 19 minutes? How yeah. did you do that? It's incredible. It's, yeah, I think that's just habit that's built over time too. Like, I, I don't know if they're doing that intentionally, but yeah. I think like how you carry yourself and what you say to yourself when you're in those moments, like is a big part of the psychology on how well you're gonna continue to perform. If you yeah. give into it right away, you're gonna be right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. if you continue, continuously remind yourself, oh my God, this sucks, I'm in so much pain. <laughs> you're gonna start carrying it in your body language. Yeah, for sure. So, Mike, I know you have some books. I think one of those, well, one of those we've all read, but I, this is one of my favorites. So This one? Yeah. Okay. How bad do you want it? You want to talk about this real quick? Yeah, just give I some mean, recommendations on things well, people can look up. I thought, like, I want to go through and just any training books or resources that we could give to people listening that, yeah. again, like, have some practical applications. And How Bad Do You Want It came to mind. I've read this one, actually, a couple of times, and, like, we did a big talk here on site as well on, like, reframing self-concept and toughness and training. Um, but I like this one a lot because it just gives a lot of good examples and stories that helped me cope with long suffering on endurance and cyclical type pieces. Uh, I don't know how it would apply to like, you know, something really short and painful like thrusters and chest bars, yeah. but like for someone who has a really tough time sitting on a machine and dealing with pain, this book is fantastic for it. It just gives a lot of good examples on distractions right like a um, one method you can use where you're literally just like counting your breaths or counting a stroke rate or just doing something to kind of like make little baby steps to get through dealing with being in pain for that amount of yeah, time i think uh before you go to the next one the distraction is very important to stay present because I, yes. I know for myself if I get into a 20 minute workout and I'm a minute in and I look at the clock and I'm hurting a lot of the discomfort is me thinking about how can I deal with this for 19 more minutes? Like I can yep. barely take it right now and I'm only a minute in, how am I gonna deal with it for 19 more minutes? 
but the paying attention to that thought versus my breathing or my stroke or something like that actually makes it more painful and makes me have to be tougher. So the distraction actually is a tool yeah. to get yourself present into the work and not focused on the time and the anxiety yeah. of what you have left to do. Yeah, I think that's a good step to getting to what they say, embracing the suffering, right? You hear that concept a lot. And what I think that means, and this book talks about it a little bit, is learning to be present in the pain instead of always wanting out of it, right? right? Like I think I know right away if I'm in the middle of something long like that and shit starts to hit the fan and the second I want out of it, I'm done, Yeah. right? So meeting it before it actually comes to you gives you more control of the situation. This book helps a lot with that where I'm like, all right, instead of me just kind of waiting for it to start to hurt, I'm gonna go after it right away. And I feel like Brandon is like that when he does these. I don't know if you think that way because you're very fit, but like, I watch you just kind of go out and attack and like almost meet it before it comes to you. Yeah, I think a lot of that probably really is just like a fitness level on certain things because there are, there are plenty of workouts that I probably couldn't do that. Like again, if it was yeah. pistols and squat cleans, I wouldn't attack it the same way. Yeah. So that, that's kind of what, you know, I, I think that people see those that are fitter than them and they automatically go to the, he has to or she has to be more tough than me. And that may be true. Like I, again, try to pride myself on like pushing hard and being tough in workouts, but there are plenty that I would also slow down on. So I think the cool thing about that book too is that there are real world examples yeah, of people exactly. that kind of fought through or struggled and then learned how to overcome. Yeah, I love I love that it's a very anecdotal and storytelling based. Like yeah. they yeah. take specific people and explain what they did. And I think also it puts into perspective a lot of people want to be good at something, yeah. right? Like and some it's not even at the best at something, just good. They want to be doing CrossFit and they want to be competitive in their gym. They want people to look at them and think their skills are good or in yeah. golf they want to yeah. go and play in a group, but a lot of people don't realize how much work is required to actually get good at something. And I think for endurance sports, this made it very clear to me like, oh, the amount of mileage and hours and discomfort yeah. that you have to deal with to get good at that sport is so high. And then it made me just pull the parallel over to CrossFit. It's like, okay, you're training people from the CrossFit games and you need to get them better at you know 6K ruck runs they're gonna have to run a lot and yeah. be doing a lot of endurance work to be able to get better at it to the point that they're even elite in the non-endurance community of CrossFit. Like, not even taking into consideration the endurance feats that are in this book. So I think for it's sure. a, it was a good learning opportunity, I think. And for most people in CrossFit, our time domains of suffering go out to like yeah. 30 minutes that or was bringing, 60 yeah, minutes. That, and That was coming to mind next is like, I would say, CrossFitters, a lot of my clients, we're all very guilty of not dealing well with long time domain of suffering. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is like, you're just going out at paces too hot that aren't sustainable. So of course, every time you deal with that situation scenario, you're gonna associate it with just, it's sucking. Yeah. But the amount of training volume and time, like look at anything that you're good at, and then there's something you're bad at, compare the time you spent at the bad thing. Is it anywhere near or close to the thing you're good at, yeah, the time I mean, you never. put into it? So you just gotta be willing. like. Do you want to be better enduring, you have to endure. Yeah. So what about this other book? I haven't read that other book. I haven't. Um, actually, I'll, I'll come back to this one. I was going to go back to like talking about something else that was important in terms of finding a reason behind the suffering, and that was Man's Search for Meaning was one of the most influential, powerful books for me in terms of framing a solid foundation of my why of dealing with suffering. And I think it like that's so important, and it starts with that. So like if you find yourself in a situation and you're just not sure why you're dealing with what you're doing, like then you need to kind of ask deeper questions and this book was really good about that. And again, it was also, I mean, it's based on true story, Viktor Frankl uh, living through the, surviving through the Holocaust. I mean, coming up with reasons to, to continue to live that put your training pain in, yeah. in a completely yeah, yeah, different yeah. perspective yeah, yeah. that makes it look like child's play. Yeah. Um, I think this book was like fantastic for reframing that. Have you read it? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, I also that what just popped into my head was Simon Sinek, uh, It Starts With Why, which is more of a business-based book and philosophy. It also has a TED Talk, I think, where he illustrates yeah. that whole concept. I think that's true. It got really promoted in the fitness industry, so I think yeah. it just kind of became a cliche one, yeah. term, but yeah. I think it kind of parallels what you're talking about, that the first thing that you need to do, like one of the things in the classroom that I'm creating my next series on and in the mentorship program that I created is helping people create a very concrete self-concept of who they were in the past, 
who they are in the present, and then a vision for who they are or who they want to be in the future and why they want to accomplish those things, like a goal setting exercise to do that. I think for physical training, you need that if you're going to be quote unquote tough, which is what this whole podcast was about. Like if you just don't have that reason, there's no purpose to really suffer in training. And a lot of people choose a training or a physical practice that is not painful because it's like, well, I just want to get good at all these things. I want to move. I want to be healthy in my body. It's like, well, you have no reason to be more physically tough. Like yeah. you're exercising to feel good, yeah. not yeah. to have some sort of deeper self-awareness from going through suffering. Yeah. Yeah. What are you laughing about? <laughs> I was remembering the time that you were trying to remember the name of the book. And like, oh, it starts with what's the point? That's also true. Yeah, what's yeah. the point? Yeah. What's the point? You, know, you brought up a good point and something that also I think I got from this book, but also just learning in general, I think kind of combines the thought process we were just talking about with dealing with suffering better it comes down to the amount of mental fatigue that you have in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I think if you've ever tried to do like a long suffering piece or even just anything painful, when you're tired, the amount of um, suffering your brain is willing to deal with is so low. Yeah. <laughs> so low. So when I see people doing extra training volume all the time to get better, but I realize they can't be tough in the small sessions that they're doing, I remove that training volume and they're just more rested and they're able to just endure and suffer better in the moment. Yeah. Right. So that's like on the psychological side of it. It's yeah. amazing what a good deload can do for that. So much. Man. Or yeah. learning how to kind of uh, be a little bit more thoughtful about your time with work and training. And that goes along for everyone, even if you have like a part time job, just learning how to balance those yeah, things. Yeah. Time management yeah, skills sure. to be able to know, like, all right, I have the next two hours to commit to this yeah. as opposed to coming in like, I got to get this done. I got to be in and out in an hour. Or like sure. your whole level of investment is different because you, I mean, consciously or subconsciously, you probably know, like if I went into this pain rabbit hole and I ended right at the 60 minute mark and I got to be out of the gym and in my car and cerebrally focused on a call afterwards, it's like tough. you're not going to dig in <laughs> yeah, as much. Yeah. I mean, two examples, like doing, you know, a 30 minute assault bike test or something like I've gone in before and I've, I've been well rested mentally, right? Like I didn't have a lot of work before and my ability to just deal with uh, and endure, deal with the pain and endure the suffering in that moment, I just felt so optimistic about it. And mm. I think that's like optimism's like the big indicator there for me. And then um, another example would be like, I had a bunch of training programs beforehand, even though my body is like physically rested, like I have no soreness, joints feel good. Like the amount of mental suffering that my brain was willing to deal with in that moment was like night and day different. Yeah, my book would be um, on kind of like just since we talked about how bad do you want it, that's more like endurance focus. I think going back to the discipline side, like when when to say no or when to just kind of dig into the skills and the, the art of the sport would be chop wood, carry water. I don't oh, know if you guys. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. Really good. Yeah, it's yeah, fantastic. It's a super short read. I, I've recommended it to a ton of clients, but it's just a great way to kind of look at like it takes time to be the best in anything and yeah. it takes a lot of dedication to the tiniest of skills. It's kind of like wax on, wax off. Yeah. <laughs> Very much you is. Yeah. Just like do the basic things and yeah. keep doing them, and then that yields the. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I'll check that one out. Um, do you got? Do you have a one? Uh, well, mine was the David Goggins book, and then I guess it starts with why. Um, yeah. I didn't come pre-prepared <laughs> with books. With why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm banging my head in shame. One thing I did want to say though is um, there's there's been a ton of research on this in general that the ability to deal with pain is largely related to the social environment and the social dynamics of, of what you're doing it for and who you're doing it with. And I know that like they've done running studies on people in the physiological internal environments are way different when somebody's running by themselves versus yeah. when they're running with the other group of people That's as a training too. group. Oh, it was in this yeah. one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And I know for myself, like if I need to go hard in a Metcon and there's other people around, I'm just, I'm not in the same state of discomfort. I don't know yeah. why. It's just, I'm focused on the other people around yeah, the group clock. Training yeah. Effect. yeah, just there. So I think there is an aspect of if you want to be tougher, surround yourself by a community of people that are tougher that you can aspire to be like. And just by being in that community, they'll probably rub off on your behaviors and your way of doing things. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a, a great point. Um, and I'm surprised we hadn't mentioned it up till right now. Yeah, but just like, the. Your ability to suffer when you're around others is just so much higher. Like, yeah. especially if there are 
if they are optimistic, well-rested people too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Don't, I, don't go to a group of people that's tired <laughs> yeah. and complaining, and complaining yeah, about everything. They're everything. all like, this is, everyone's bitching about yeah. how bad yeah, it's Don't be so, around those people. Yeah, we come into <laughs> yeah. training every once in a while where I feel like we're like that. I'm like, uh, yeah. everything's sore, I don't want to do this. I'm pretty grateful <laughs> of that though, here on site. Like, people here will call you out on that. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I do my best to, one, like you not You called bring yourself it. out yesterday. I did, yeah, I was like. <laughs> or two days ago. Two days ago, I didn't sleep well, and I woke up and was like, I'm not gonna complain about this all day long. He did. I walked in the door, and the first thing I said was, God, I'm so tired. I was like, no, I did it! <laughs> yeah, so, Fail. Yeah, I think um, having a good group training environment that will um, make you rise to the occasion is super helpful. Yeah, and hold you accountable, too. Like, uh, some people will say, I want to do this, I want to get better at it, I'm going to come on a regular basis, and then they don't, and I feel like that community can help pull you into being competitive and accountable to the process of getting tougher and suffering more. Do you think you can reach a level of toughness where you've just got it and it's there forever? I do, I think, I, I think the more suffering you go through, the toughness, yes. Whether that toughness transfers into high performance, no, because you can decondition. But I still think that if you have gone through a tough path in your life, that just on a willingness to deal with discomfort if you do regain a purpose, yeah. you'll always be able to push yourself. It's yeah. just that you're pushing yourself might not be at that same performance level. You just might be a chump because you haven't done anything for three or four years, <laughs> but you still have something inside that allows you to dig in and push. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, this isn't really like a closing thought, but it could be one of the yeah. last points. If you crush it, then yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a misconception that people think, I'll get to a certain point where I just won't have to deal with pain and suffering anymore, and that's not true. I think you just get better at dealing with it. Yeah. And, and I, don't, I don't think that at all of a sudden, workouts are just gonna stop hurting because you got tough enough. Uh, I, don't like, think, so I think sometimes workouts hurt more as you get more fit or you don't have the bottlenecks. I have a lot of people that exactly. like, you get muscle ups and chest to bars and all of a sudden there's muscle ups in a workout and you're going faster and you're like, oh my God, that hurts so bad. Well, it's because now you can do five unbroken yeah. every round. Or yeah, now you can be more dense in yeah. the execution. I hear people it. say like, what are mindset approaches? What are things I can do to make it not hurt so bad? And I'm like, you got to reframe that right away and just expect that it's always going to hurt, but just have confidence that you're going to be able to deal with it better. Mm. All right. That's a was good way to finish. All right. That's a good way to finish. I can't follow it up. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Anything Thank you for watching. Add? Yep. Nope. Thank you, you for watching. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep cutting them off every time you do it. Thanks for listening to the Corpus Animus <laughs> podcast on toughness from two of the toughest guys I know. Oh, thanks, man. Let's go train. <laughs> Ryan.